Welcome to His Gospel Christian Fellowship. It's an honor to have you join us in worship service today. We invite you to visit us virtually at any time. Our mission is to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to love and support one another in our Christian growth. We are not here to judge, criticize, or condemn anyone. We teach, preach, and live God's Word and God's Word alone.
Amen, amen, and amen. God is truly good. He's worthy of all of our honor, worthy of all of our praise, worthy of all the glory. Anything that we can give to God, we must give it to him. Amen. I want to welcome you to His Gospel Christian Fellowship. I'm Pastor AJ, and it is a blessing, as always, to have you join us in fellowship today. Whether it be morning, night, afternoon, whatever time of the day it is, we want to thank you for joining us in fellowship and in worship and in getting to know who God is. Uh, it's always a blessing to have you worship with us. We love having you here with us. We love having a community that can gather together, even if it be online, where we can just talk about the good news of Christ, where we can share uh, the, the glory of God, and where we can just learn and fellowship and love on one another. So thank you for joining us and welcome to His Gospel Christian Fellowship. Uh, many of you uh, that join in regularly, you know how this goes. Go ahead and grab your Bible. We're going to open today's service, open today's message with a little bit of reading from God's Word. This is our opening scripture, and today I'm going to be coming from Psalm 150, and as always, I am reading out of the New Living Translation for the opening scripture. Amen? So I'll give us some time to get there. This is Psalm 150. Psalm 150 is a psalm of praise. So when we read this, we must have the attitude, the spirit of praising God, our Father, our Lord. Amen. Verse one begins, praise the Lord with exclamation marks. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. So praise him wherever he is. Praise him for his mighty works. 
Praise his unequaled greatness, so praise who he is. Praise him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with the clash of the cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. So praise him with, with everything that you have. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you have air in your lungs, then you ought to praise the Lord. You ought to be clapping and jumping and shouting and smiling and happy. God is good and he's worthy of all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Please join me in praying, amen. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you that we have a, a space to gather, to study your word, to get to know who you are, Lord, to grow, Lord, for our, strength, our, our spirits to be strengthened and, and nourished, Lord. We thank you for the opportunities that you have given us, Lord. Your word says that eyes that see, ears that hear, both are gifts from the Lord. And we thank you. We thank you for every air, every breath of air that we take. We thank you for the oxygen in our lungs, Lord. And we pray that today you would see our study, that you would see our worship, that you would see our praise, that you would see our honor, that you would see us magnifying you, that you would see it as, 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 as acceptable and pleasing in your sight, Lord. So we thank you for everything that you are. We thank you for everything that you do. We worship you. All of God's people in agreement said, amen. Amen and amen. Man, and my boy, am I just so excited today. I have a word from God that I know is going to be a, a blessing. It's going to be a blessing to so many of you. Um, the Lord has really been doing some, some incredible things in my life. And I know that without a doubt, what he's doing in my life and what he's sharing with me and what he has told me to share with you all is really going to lead you down the path of righteousness. It's going to lead you uh, in, a, in, a, in an area of your life that, that God would love to see you grow. He's going to lead you to a destination ultimately that is for your, your good, for your own well, well doing. So I'm thankful that you're here and I'm just so blessed to share the, the word that I have for you today. Uh, go ahead and open your Bibles. We're going to go all the way to the back to, to the beginning of the Bible, and I'm going to be reading out of the book of Genesis. I have just one verse with, for you today. It's a, it's a short verse, but it is important and paramount nonetheless. Amen. This is going to be Genesis chapter 43, and I am only reading verse 9. And for today, I, spill a, I feel a little bit of an extra anointing, so I'm going to be reading from the King James Version, amen. So the language that we have here is going to be a little bit uh, more uh, dated, amen. So Genesis chapter 43, uh, verse 9. And this is the brothers returning to Egypt. There's a group of men, they are all brothers, and they are returning to Egypt. So if they're returning to Egypt, that means that they were already there, they left, and now they are coming back. That's where we are today. Verse 9 begins. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. Let me bear the blame forever. Let me bear the blame forever. There we see some words that um, a lot of people are afraid to say. Let me bear the blame forever. Today, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, politicians and pundits, I want to share with you the title of today's message. If you will indulge me for just a moment, the subject of today's message is a world without responsibility. A world without responsibility. For all of my note takers out there, that's your title. A world without responsibility. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you for this word. I thank you that you have given me the opportunity to um, eat it for myself, to learn from it for myself, and to take it to others so that they may learn as well, Lord. I pray today that I would be decreased and that you and your message would be increased, Lord. I pray today that you would use me as a vessel to teach your people, the sheep of your pasture, Lord. I thank you, I pray that we would all grow, that we would all learn, that we would develop in our wisdom, understanding, discernment, humility, and responsibility, Lord. I 
thank you. In Jesus' name, all of God's children in agreement said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. In 1995, Oprah Winfrey's television program featured a guest speaker who openly discussed her drug abuse addiction. This confession from the guest would inspire Oprah Winfrey to make her own pub public revelation. And in this program, Oprah confessed that she had smoked crack cocaine while in her 20s. An article in the Washington Post about the television episode described Oprah's remarks. Winfrey talked to the audience of the shame she felt about her dark secret and how her friend, poet Maya Angelou, had once said to her, you did what you knew how to do. And when you knew better, you did better. You knew, you did what you thought was the right thing to do. You did what you knew what to do. And when you knew better, you did better. Wow, wow. The quote from Maya Angelou deeply resonated with me. You did what you know how to do, what you knew how to do. And when you knew better, you did better. This quote resonated with me because it speaks to each person's moral imperative to do better, especially when they know better. This is paramount, ladies and gentlemen, because everywhere we look, we see individuals constantly abdicating themselves of any and all responsibility. Politicians who are constantly pointing the finger at one another. Republicans blaming the Democrats, Democrats pointing their fingers at the Republicans, Gen Z pointing at baby boomers, baby boomers pointing at millennials, board members who do nothing but publicly ridicule and place blame on another at board meetings. Numerous policemen who are too afraid to confront one gunman on a rampage in a school. Responsibility. Men who do not first take care of their children but then are confused when their children have no respect for them. Women who have children but no desire to mother, responsibility. Parents who give their children to other people and institutions to bear their own responsibility. Children who do not respect their parents, do their chores, do their homework or study, and instead point a finger at the teacher. Tech companies who will not take responsibility for the impact that they're having on children's mental self-image, their self-image, their mental health, and overall, their moral decay. Food organizations who will not take responsibility for people's increase in food consumption-related illnesses and disorders, cancer, diabetes, obesity. Employees who make every excuse to not adequately perform their jobs. Hence, the great resignation. Businesses and owners who write shrewd contracts that absolve them of any responsibility in the event of their own mistake. Brothers and sisters, there exists today a scarcity of individuals who will take responsibility. The field of psychology even identifies what is called diffusion of responsibility, which is a socio-psychological uh, phenomenon whereby a person is less likely to take responsibility for action or inaction when other bystanders or witnesses are present. But if we look far back enough, if we look back far enough, we learn that this generation is not the first generation to point the finger. We see the disappearance of responsibility way back in the Garden of Eden. When sin entered the world, Adam blamed Eve. Eve would blame the serpent. Their fall and inability to take responsibility would inevitably lead to the demise of their son Cain and the death of their son Abel. When God asked Cain, where is your brother? Cain would respond, am I my brother's keeper? Look at Genesis chapter 4 verse 9. No responsibility. But today I inform you that God is looking for individuals who will take responsibility. God is looking for people who will say, the buck stops with me. God is looking for, looking for people who will stand at the front and say, you know what? I am responsible for this. I am going to take responsibility. I am going to be the chain breaker. I am going to be the change maker. God is looking for people who will take responsibility. Number one, the first task bestowed on us as people was one of responsibility. 
God made Adam, placed him in the garden, and then gave him the responsibility of naming all of the animals. God took Moses and gave him the responsibility of leading the Israelites out of Egypt. God took Mary and gave her the responsibility of being the mother of Jesus. God took Esther and gave her the responsibility of saving the lives of the Jews. God wants you, and you are to have a responsibility, and you are to walk out that responsibility, accountability, responsibility. Each commandment that we were to follow was one of responsibility. Every parable that Jesus spoke revealed to us the responsibility that we each are to bear. When Christ himself died for us, he took responsibility. He bared the sins and the burden of the sins that we committed and died for us. When we look at this one short verse in Genesis chapter 43, it is unfair that I begin this story at this point here. So let me give you a little bit of context. Let me give you a little bit of context. Joseph was the youngest of 11 brothers. And because he was his father's favorite child, his brothers who often his brothers often would mistreat him. Their mistreatment of him would eventually lead them to sell him into slavery. He would be enslaved for a decade, and he would spend much of this time in prison, falsely accused. After an, after an extended period of time, he would leave the prison, be promoted, and become the second in command of all of Egypt. Talk about a, a rise up resurrection story. Joseph would rise from the ashes of poverty, the ashes of enslavement, the ashes of the prison, and become the second in command of all of Egypt. Soon thereafter, a widespread famine would take place, causing many people in the region to resort to traveling to Egypt out of desperation to buy food. And on one day, one occasion, one moment, Joseph's brothers would appear at his feet not recognizing who he now is, but requesting for his provision of food. Unrecognized, he is using this opportunity to teach his brothers a lesson on responsibility. Unrecognized, he is using this opportunity to teach his brothers a lesson on responsibility. And only through time, guilt, and suffering has this band of brothers Learn what it truly means to bear responsibility. Through this text, God also wants us to see what it means to exemplify responsible etiquette. So what must we learn about responsibility? Well, God has shown me a number, a lot of revelation, a great depth of revelation as to what it means to be responsible and how we are to behave as responsible individuals. So point one, write this down. I will, this is a question first. The question that we have to ask ourselves is what is responsibility? What is it? What is responsibility? Before we understand what it means to be responsible, what is responsibility? Well, the word responsibility is about responding or answering for your decisions and actions. That's a very elementary definition for responsibility. Many people know that. Let me go a little bit deeper, perhaps. That's not all. Akrayut is a Hebrew word that means responsibility. And the prefix or the base word, the root word of, of Akrayut is akur, achur, which means other. Thus, responsibility is about our moral commitment to the other person, not just to answer for our actions, but to make others' needs our own. We have to think of the other. We must often put others before ourselves. That's what responsibility is. Not only to take accountability for one's own actions and decisions and repercussions, but to think about the other. That is responsibility. So as we read this story, one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is what must, what does a responsible individual do? What must a responsible individual do to be considered responsible? And the Lord has shown me point number one in this text. Point number one, a responsible individual sees and occasionally foresees a need. They have to see and occasionally foresee a need. 
a little bit of context, Jacob, who was the father of all of these boys, who he's also named Israel, he's commanding his sons when he says the following in Genesis chapter 43, verse 2 from the King James Version. He says, he says, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn, which they brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, go again, buy us a little food. So when we look at this text, what we see is the father, Jacob, also named Israel is seeing the provision laid before he and his family and all of the sons that he has and all of the grandsons that he has and, and his wives and their wives. And he's saying the food that we have remaining, the resources that we have left over is not going to go much further. And what we have to do is we have to be willing to go back to where we came from to get this provision and, and, and attain additional provision. It is an irresponsible individual that is oblivious to needs only cares about the moment and feels absolutely no pressure to provide for others. If you're looking for a husband or a wife, look for someone that sees need. Think about that someone that thinks about the future and someone who is unafraid and unashamed to think that it is their personal duty to provide for others. Any other type of person is going to be a liability and the last thing you want, believe me, is liability. Jacob is looking at the remaining food he and his family have, and he realizes that their remaining food cannot sustain them much longer. So he takes it upon himself to galvanize his sons so, so that they may return to Egypt and gather the materials that they need. And notice that I keep saying need, because this is not about what we want. This is not about what we desire. This is not what, about what we prefer. This is not about what we wish, but rather responsibility has to see what is needed and responsibility ha has to take the steps. Responsibility has to take the steps necessary to provide for what is needed. Well, as we read the scripture, we also find out that Jacob is old and not only is he old, but he is becoming blind. And I thought that this was interesting as I studied this text because Jacob is old, he's becoming blind, yet he has not found an excuse to justify his own inaction. He still sees that it's, sees it as his responsibility to provide for his, his children, for his offspring. Without great eyesight, he is still able to foresee a need. Old, he is still wise. The only way to foresee a need is to think about the future. What does the future hold is one of the questions that a person must ask. A person must also ask this question, who is affected by what the future entails? And the last question, what are the repercussions for not meeting the needs? So I enlighten you today to be responsible, to see the needs, to see what other people need, to foresee the problems that, that will eventually and inevitably come about. A responsible person sees needs and foresees needs. Amen? So a question that you may ask yourself is, what happens when you see a need, but you still have no means of supplying for that need? What happens when you know that something is going to be needed, when we're going to be in a, in a, in a, st in a, st a stand or, or, or a, a place of lack? but we have no strategy about how to, uh, to get out and rise out to, sur in, uh, to surmount from this place of lack, amen? And it's in those moments when a person must rely on Philippians chapter four, verse 19, which says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That oftentimes in life, we may see a need, but then the question then becomes as how can we supply it or provide for this need? In moments where we may not be able to, we have to rely on God and know that our God through his glorious riches, through his riches in Christ Jesus will supply all of our need. We also must realize and be able to recall and lean on Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, which says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We must lean on, rely on, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and know that anything that we absolutely need, the Lord will provide it for us. It will be added unto us. 
So I'll leave you with this final remark. Point number one, a responsible individual sees and occasionally foresees a need. As I continued to read chapter 43, I found uh, some, some, some more information that I thought is, it would be incredibly important for us that God revealed to me. Point number two, make sure to write this down. A responsible individual is willing and will sacrifice. A responsible individual will sacrifice. Jacob, who I say again is named Israel, is giving instructions to his sons when he says the following in Genesis, uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 43, verse 11 through uh, 14. He says this, And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so now, do this. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels, and carry down the man a present, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. And take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks. Carry it again in your hand. Peradventure, it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise, go again unto the man. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. In this set of verses, what we are observing is Jacob making a sacrificial decision. He has hope that his sacrifice will bring a great return, an even greater return. And all throughout scripture, we see admirable individuals, admirable characters who make responsibility-focused sacrifices in hopes that a favorable outcome may come to fruition. Moses' mother made a sacrifice when she played him, when she placed him in the Nile River in a successful effort to save his life. Abraham gave us an example of sacrifice when he took his own son, placed him on the altar, and then readied himself to kill Isaac because the Lord had directed him to do so. What we have is so many examples of people who were willing to, to sacrifice something that they valued highly in an effort to, to make a greater decision and a greater commitment to the purpose, the plan, the will of God. And ultimately, what we see is Jesus making a sacrifice when he had the power to call down innumerable angels, yet he allowed himself to be crucified for our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, we are healed. By his stripes, we are healed. That's a verse from Isaiah chapter 53. Verse five, individuals who are responsible are willing to make sacrifices. A supporting scripture comes from John chapter three, verse 16, and this is from the New Living Translation, but it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God was ready to say, God sacrificed because there was a greater mission that his people that I, that you, that we together would be redeemed of our sins, that the, that the atonement of our sins would come through his son, Jesus Christ. A responsible individual will sacrifice, point number two. Point number three, a responsible individual is honest. To be responsible, you have to be honest. We learn about honesty in Genesis chapter 43, verses 20 through 22 from the King James Version. Judah, a brother uh, uh, from the band of brothers, is confessing to a household manager when he says the following in Genesis chapter 43, verse 20. He says, and sir, and, and, and said, oh, sir, we came indeed down at the first time to buy food. And it came to pass when we came to the end that we opened our sacks. And behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight, and we have brought it again in your hand. He says, the last time we were here, we paid you money. As we were returning back to where we came from, we found the money still in our bag. 
and we're here to give that money back. And not only are we going to return that money that we initially gave to you and somehow ended up in our sacks, he also says, and other money have we brought down in our hands to buy food. We cannot tell who put money in our sacks. He says, not only are we returning to you the money that we gave you previously, we have more money that we're willing to give to you. We have more money that we're willing to give to you. He's honest. He sees himself as being in him. He sees that what he gave previously somehow ended up back in his bag. And he, what he had was an opportunity to act as if it wasn't there. But he is a changed individual. So he's there to return the money that he had previously bought, somehow ended up back in his bag. And not only that, he's there to give more money in addition to that. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9 from the New Living Translation, what we see is the word of God tells us people with integrity walk safely, but those who follow crooked paths will be exposed. Those who follow crooked paths will be exposed. God is looking for people who have integrity. And not only will they uh, showcase their integrity, but they will be able to walk safely. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 29 from the New Living Translation tells us this. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to those with integrity, but destroys the wicked. It destroys the wicked. As evidenced by people we know, people we come in contact with, headlines on the news, and exposés and scandals, we know that people lie. People lie. But the Bible tells us that do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. For whatsoever a man sow, that shall he also reap. That means that lies will be exposed and integrity will too be exposed and it will all work out for the glory of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. God has tasked us and given us the responsibility of being honest. So point three, we end with a responsible individual is honest. A responsible individual is honest. Point number four, point number four, it says this. A responsible individual shows love for enemies. Now, I know that this is going to be a hard, this will be a hard pill for some people to swallow. This is a hard reality that some people will have to face. But the truth of the matter is, is that responsible individuals love their enemies. In Genesis 43, we see Joseph, the brother who has been betrayed, act in a way that is so honorable, so uh, it showcases so much integrity, and it is such a, a dignified move. A little bit of context, Joseph is feeding or feasting with the same brothers that betrayed him. He is sitting, well, he is sitting in a room with the same brothers that showed him for, for some money and that left him out to die, that left him hanging. He is not only sitting amongst them, but he is the one feeding them. Genesis chapter 43, verse 32 through 43 says, uh, And they sat for him by himself, and for them by themselves, and for the Egyptians would did eat with him by themselves, because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination, that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men marveled at one another. And he took and sent messages unto them from before him. But Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. These verses here, this is verse 32 through 34. And what is happening here is Joseph has welcomed his brothers into his home. He has seated them at their table, at a table. He has organized them in order from oldest to youngest. While they're sitting at their table eating, he is sitting at his table eating, and the other Egyptians that are there who are amongst Joseph and his brothers or who work for Joseph, they're sitting at a table and they're eating. And Joseph is feeding the same people who betrayed him. He is providing for the same people that left him out to die, that left him out to hanging, that left him in a, de a place of, 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 of depravity, who left him in a place of, of, of of just complete um, of, uh, lowliness. They just left him out to die, and he's feeding them. This is important for us to study because what we learn is something um, that is aligned to the character of God. Verse of Matthew, chapter, Matthew chapter 5, 
verses 43 through 44 from the New Living Translation says, you have heard that it has been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. God says a lot of people will say that you're supposed to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But then verse 44, he goes on to say, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is important for us to understand because what it does is it exemplifies the holiness. It exemplifies the love that God has had for us and the love that we ought to have for those who have persecuted us. For those who have slapped us on one cheek, God has told us that we are to turn the other cheek. I want to point out something to you here because I wouldn't be a good teacher if I did, if I did not point this out. But I think it's important for us to notice that although Joseph is feeding his brothers, the same people that betrayed him, he is still sitting at his own table. And I think that that's important for us to understand because although God has called us to love our enemies, he has called us to forgive those who have used us, who have abused us, who have battered us, he has not called us to still walk, continue to walk in alignment with them. We do not have to live in every moment of our lives with them. We, have, we have, are called to forgive. We are called to, to, to love those who are our, our enemies, but we do not have to continue to live among them. Joseph is feeding his brothers, yet he is seated at a different table. And right now, I want to break the chains off of someone, someone who knows and who has experienced hostility, someone who has been hated on by, their, by perhaps even family members or friends or colleagues or co-workers, someone that, someone that has entirely used them, who has lied on them, who has caused them so much pain, so much turmoil, so much hostility. God has chosen and has told and has placed on you the responsibility of loving and forgiving, but you do not have to continue to live among them. You have the choice of sitting at your own table. So I say, notice that the brothers are at their own table. You do not have to invite them to your table, but you still are responsible for loving them. God has called us to do so. And in the end, I want you to, uh, to know from point number four, a responsible individual show, uh, shows love for their enemies. A responsible individual shows love for their enemies. So as we've studied this, we've learned about what it means to be responsible. God has called each and every one of us to be responsible in the various avenues and endeavors he has given to us and to also be responsible in the walk that he has for us as we walk alongside him. So in conclusion, you are called to be responsible. You're called to be responsible. You must be responsible. And that means being accountable for your own actions and decisions, but also caring about the other and walking out that care actively for the other. In conclusion, when Judah says, I will be surety for him, of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever, which is in Genesis chapter 43, verse 9. He is showing that he has learned. He's showing that he's learned. He has learned what it means to be responsible. After all, it was Judah who initially had the idea to sell Joseph into slavery. It was Judah who had the idea to accept the money in exchange for his own brother. But here he is, finally showing us that he knows what it means to be his brother's keeper. He knows what it means to be his brother's keeper. He has finally learned what it means to be responsible. Friends, this behavior is also what God has commanded of us. Ultimately, God has given us life. And if God has given us life, then he has given us much. And from what the scripture tells us, he who much is given, much is required. That's responsibility. You can do it. I encourage you to do it. Go ahead and be responsible. Be responsible. You can do it. Make responsible decisions. Think about others. Think about the future and know that you have an active role in the future. You must pick up your responsibilities and know that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, which we can find in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And if God has told you and God has called you to be responsible, then you best believe he has equipped you and he has strengthened you to do it. 
So what I'd like to do is I would like to give a reiteration of the points that we've discussed here today. Point one, a responsible individual sees and occasionally foresees a need. Don't forget that. Point number two, a responsible individual will sacrifice. You have to make sacrifices. Point three, a responsible individual is honest. We have to be led by honesty. Point number four, a responsible individual shows love for enemies. Love. You don't have to continue to live among them, but you must love them and you must allow God to work through you as you love them. Amen? In conclusion, you are, you are called to be responsible. Did you know that God has, has placed us here to give our worship to God? He's placed us here that we might worship him, that we might honor and praise him. That's part of our responsibility. We're not here to just eat and, and have fun and, and to gossip and to go out on trips and to, to live lives the way that we think we should live. No, we are called to serve God. That's our responsibility. You have a responsibility to do this. And if you realize that you have a responsibility to do this and you have accepted that responsibility to worship, praise, honor, magnify God, then right now what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you an opportunity to accept him first as your own personal Lord and Savior. I'd like to give you an opportunity, an invitation for Christian discipleship. So wherever you are, just go ahead and repeat these words after me because the word of God says that we must believe in our heart and confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when we do that, then we are saved. So repeat after me. This is the Lord's Prayer, and it says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen if you said those words you confess with your mouth and you believed in your heart that jesus christ is lord then you're saved and this is the best moment in your life to be saved to, uh, to communicate to God that you have allowed him to not only be your savior, because that, that is what he is, whether we accept it or not, but you have also communicated to him that you have allowed him to be your Lord, which means that where he says go, you will go. That what he says do, you will do. What he says say, you will say. What he says believe, you will believe. You will allow him to master your life, to be master and ruler and the ultimate authority over your life. And that he truly is, amen? So I wanna take this time to also invite you to become a member of his Gospel Christian Fellowship. We love people here, we love God, and we love to teach and preach God's word and live, uh, uh, live according to God's word, amen? We're not here to judge, criticize, or condemn anyone. We're here to show people the good news of Christ. We're here to love people and ultimately to help people walk a more close relationship with God. And if that's what you are willing to do, if that's what you are desiring to do, then we invite you to become a member here at His Gospel Christian Fellowship. And you don't have to, you don't have to walk through all of these procedures. We'd like for you to join us regularly. Come and get to know us. We invite you to contact us and I'll be sharing our contact information. But we invite you to be a member here, amen? So become a member. Uh, today I want to deliver uh, the benediction scripture, and this is from the book of Jude, which is the second to last book of the Bible, one chapter only, verse 24, and it says, it is a prayer of praise. It says, now all glory to God, who was able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our great Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, all glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. That is our benediction for today. Let me pray over you and then we'll have a, a I want to remind you of some announcements that are sure to follow. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. 
We thank you for the time that you have given us, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to study, to understand, to, to, to digest your word, Lord. We pray that as we leave from this place, that we would not just hear your words and then forget about what you have said, Lord. We pray that as we leave this place, we will continue to walk out your words, Lord. We thank you for your decrees as they are a lamp unto our pathway, a light unto our feet, Lord, that they guide us, that they show us the truth, that they show us what way to go, Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will show you which path to take. Lord, thank you for showing us the path before us. We know that you have plans to prosper us and not to harm us, plans to give us a future and a hope, and we trust you, Lord. All of God's people in agreement said, amen, amen. And amen. I'd like for you to stay engaged with the remainder of today's service. We also have some contact information that is going to pop up on your screen right now. And we invite you to go ahead and contact us. You can contact that is us at his gospel at his gospel, uh, org, And we also invite you to call that number. You can text that number and that way you're better able to stay abreast of any of the updates here that we're making at his gospel. We love you. We thank you. We applaud you. And we praise God for you for having you join us today. And we're just so thankful that you were able to chime in. We love you. God bless you. Have a blessed day. And we'll see you next time. If you're looking for a church home, look no further. You can become a member of HGCF no matter where you live in the world. We would love to have you become a part of our family. If you'd like more information about our church, or if you'd like to join with us, just send an email to hisgospel at hisgospel.org. Again, that's hisgospel at hisgospel.org. We'd love to hear from you. Giving is a part of worship. If you don't already give virtually, now is a great time to do so. You can go to our website and click on the Give button at the top of our landing page. Your giving is a matter between you and the Lord. However, we do want you to know that when you give to HGCF, that the money given is used directly and exclusively in supporting God's work. No member of the leadership of His Gospel receives a salary or a stipend from the church.